set up again. Um, Sorry. Well, the last contribution of the afternoon is uh, an engineering supported sorry, engineering-supported rhodium catalyst for CO hydrogenation, the addition of molybdenum to rhodium on alumina. Yep. It's given by Henry Lamb, Prasad, and George Roberts. Yes, yeah. I, I was going to that, I think, but anyway, it's okay. going to be fine. Well, I recognize my co-workers here, uh, Prasad, Chutuke, and George Roberts uh, at North Carolina State. Uh, this research was sponsored by the Department of Energy, uh, Pittsburgh, Energy Technology Center. Uh, our objective uh, were to try to improve the selectivity, as as everyone has been focusing on here, of rhodium catalysts for uh, CO hydrogenation, particularly the C2 plus uh, compounds, and to also try to better understand the role of these early transition metal promoters, such as molybdenum, in accomplishing uh, an, act, an increase in activity as well as an increase in selectivity uh, to C2 plus compounds. Uh, our strategy really was to try to say, okay, uh, we know that uh, addition of molybdenum to rhodium alumina catalyst has been reported to increase activity, it's been reported to increase selectivity uh, to uh, oxygenates, but there's also been some speculation as to what the structure might be. The interfacial contact between rhodium and molybdenum oxide, is that important? Uh, how do we uh, design catalysts or engineer catalysts where we can control the chemical interaction between the rhodium and the molybdenum and try to understand is this structure maximize the concentration of one particular type of site and is this structure what's important in, in these changes in activity and selectivity that we see. So the two strategies that we, we took was first of all we took molybdenum alumina, basically a molybdenum oxide on alumina catalyst uh, at a half model layer loading and a full model layer loading and we applied uh, rhodium, uh, tetrarhodium carbonyl to this and then decomposed it at low temperature, hoping that there wouldn't be any significant migration of the molybdenum at a low temperature onto the surface of the rhodium, so we literally could just sit a rhodium particle on the surface of molybdenum oxide. Okay, we're on the bare spot of the alumina, depending on how well covered the aluminum was. The second approach was to take a rhodium on alumina catalyst prepared from rhodium-4 and then selectively, we hope, absorb molybdenum hexacarbonyl on the surface of the rhodium particles that are already formed, and then compare these two catalysts as to their activity and selectivity in CO hydrogenation. So first of all, the catalyst synthesis was pretty straightforward. Uh, really focus on the cluster-derived systems. This goes back to the work of Professor Ichikawa uh, we simply absorbed rhodium-4 from dry hexanes onto the solid. We were making sure to absorb the material, so we washed off the excess with uh, fresh hexanes. We then decomposed the cluster in situ in helium, not in hydrogen, at 200 degrees C, okay, to produce uh, metallic rhodium. The molybdenum alumina catalyst was prepared uh, in a straightforward manner. We used ammonium heptamolybdate. Uh, incipient wetness impregnation, dried and calcite and flowing oxygen at 500 degrees C. It should give a fairly well spread layer of molybdenum oxide on alumina. Uh, we used half monolayer and full monolayer loadings based on the surface area of the starting material, the starting alumina. The molybdenum modified rhodium catalyst, what we did there was we prepared the cluster derived rhodium on alumina catalyst, and then we sublimed molybdenum hexacarbonyl on the surfaces uh, by exposing the catalyst, the rhodium on alumina catalyst, to the vapor at 50 degrees C, a temperature at which molybdenum carbonyl would tend to desorb if it were merely fizzy-sorbed on the surface of the carrier. And after 30 minutes of this exposure, we would pump out the unreacted hexacarbonyl, and we activated the catalyst similarly by heating it uh, 200 degrees in helium. Now, first of all, just a little bit of review. We went back and looked at some of the chemistry of rhodium-4 on gamma alumina. If you put rhodium-4 on gamma alumina, you get an infrared spectrum that looks like this. This carbonyl compound doesn't have this infrared spectrum. This is the infrared spectrum that's been assigned to rhodium-6 CO16. You convert the rhodium-4 cluster to the rhodium-6 cluster on adsorption. Then as you heat this in helium, you decompose it via the uh, gen dicarbonyl species. Finally, when there's no, uh, well, well, we didn't completely remove all the CO, but basically when you have a minimum of CO left, you re-expose this at 50 degrees C to CO, you just get the gen dicarbonyl bands look back, which is suggestive of a highly dispersed uh, rhodium on alumina catalyst. Now, 
We also took a look at the XAS of the system, XAS spectra uh, for the system. The as is here refers to as absorbed. This is the rhodium, rhodium four, uh, starting from the rhodium four compound. And the only point here, qualitatively, I didn't analyze these data quantitatively. Qualitatively, you see strong oscillations at high K, at high energy, indicating there's still metal-metal bonding and there's still a cluster there on the surface of the alumina. Now, when we decompose that cluster by heating in helium, what we find is that the oscillations are of similar amplitude, but the frequency has changed. And quantitatively, if you analyze this XS data, you find that particles, metallic rhodium particles, are formed on the surface of the volumina with a coordination number of about four. Okay, this is from the uh, tetra rhodium precursor. Coordination number of about four a normal rhodium-rhodium bond distance, and this suggests that the rhodium-6, which is what we formed originally from the rhodium-4, remember the rhodium-4 goes down, forms rhodium-6, this has just been decomposed to give small hexanuclear clusters of rhodium, which is consistent with some electron microscopy that's also in the literature. Now, the only other thing we find is some carbon and oxygen contamination from probably just disproportionation or dissociation of the CO during the heating. So there is some, there are some carbon and oxygen scatterers there. The only other piece of data on this overhead that's important is that if you heat this material in CO and hydrogen at one atmosphere, these small particles aren't stable. They will start to agglomerate or start to center if you heat just for one hour in syngas at atmospheric pressure. So it's not as if uh, the hexanuclear cluster is what's present under the actual reaction conditions. Now, the next point, that's basically what you form from rhodium foreign alumina, which has been pretty well uh, covered before. But one thing we did find that was interesting, though, is that if you take the rhodium-4, which has the same surface chemistry on three different aluminas, GUSA, GRACE, and VISTA, catapal, catapal uh, MI-307, and aluminum oxide C, and you have the same, this is the at CO hydrogenation at 200 degrees, 30 atmospheres, so 2 to 1 hydrogen CO ratio, 9,000 gas thyroid really space velocity. What we find is the activities of those catalysts are basically the same. The interesting thing, though, is that the catapal, catapal uh, catalyst produces mainly methanol. Okay? The others produce methane and a mixture of methanol and higher hydrocarbons, uh, higher alcohol, excuse me. Now, the one thing we also find, if we go to 250 degrees C and take a look at these materials, first of all, this is that same data just shown in a, in a graphical form. This is the Degusa, Grace, product distributions from the Degusa, Grace, and Vista samples uh, at 200 degrees C. And you see a preponderance of methanol coming from the, from the Vista material. Now, the speculation here is basically this is a more basic material. This, this material is derived from a chloride, this is derived from a sulfate, uh, this is derived from a hydroxide uh, from bromide. And so basically, uh, this more basic material enables you to produce methanol with a, a rhodium on alumina catalyst at 200 degrees C. Now, if you increase the reaction temperature to, 200, excuse me, to 250 degrees C, what you find now is mainly methanation. Okay? At 250 degrees C, primary product is methane, get very little methanol, very, you do still get some C2 plus, hydro, C2 plus oxygenase from the uh, uh, Degusa and Grace samples. And now, so to wrap this little short section up, for the rhodium-4 on these aluminas, the majority of the precursors converted to rhodium-6. Uh, decarbonylation of these surface species yields hexarhodium clusters in helium. Uh, this decarbonylated surface species, the hexarhodium, will chemisorb CO to form only the gem dicarbonyl. There's no linear CO species. We don't see any linear CO species. The rhodium clusters grow larger under atmospheric pressure CO hydrogenation conditions. The activity doesn't depend on the source of the alumina, the chemical purity of the alumina. The activities of these catalysts are basically the same, but depending on the source of the alumina, we observe that on, on catapal, catapal A, the uh, Bomite, ex bomite material produces 70% oxygenase, whereas the other two produce 55% oxygenase. This is at 200 degrees C, but about 25% <laughs> methane. 
If you increase the reaction temperature 250 degrees C, you get hydrocarbons, consistent basically with what others have seen. Now, let's talk about the samples that are prepared from molybdenum alumina. Okay? The, the take home message here is first of all, if you put rhodium 4 on just unmodified alumina, you get rhodium 6. If you put rhodium 4 on molybdenum alumina, you immediately form gym dicarbonyl rhodium. Okay? The first message is you put rhodium, a cl rhodium cluster on a molybdenum treated alumina surface, it immediately breaks up and oxidatively fragments to form gym dicarbonyl rhodium. If you remove that CO by heating in helium and then re expose the sample to CO, you get back gym dicarbonyl rhodium. So you get breakup or oxidative fragmentation of rhodium clusters on molybdenum oxide surfaces. Exact same thing happens when you have what is a one monolayer equivalent of molybdenum oxide on aluminum. Okay? So on molybdenum oxide surfaces, rhodium clusters, rhodium carbonyl clusters oxidatively fragment. So this supports the idea that on molybdenum oxide surfaces, rhodium will be in a higher oxidation state, at least in this particular evidence from the surface chemistry. Now we can back this up by looking at the XAFs. If you remember the XAFs of the rhodium-4 on the alumina, you have significant strong oscillations out here. Okay, high K. Now after we pretty this, the alumina surface with molybdena, these are gone. If you take the Fourier transform of this data, what you see is that you have basically three components and they are assigned to the carbon and the oxygen of the CO on the bicarbonyl, and this is the oxygen bond to the surface. In this case, we speculate to the molybdenum oxide surface, not to the alumina surface. Okay? So now, how does this catalyst perform as compared to the base? So I've got to pick a base. Okay? I'm going to pick, first of all, the Degusa uh, sample, Degusa alumina. And if you look, what you see is that the activity, this is half monolayer, full monolayer, the activity goes up basically linearly with molybdenum content. Okay? This is consistent with the literature. But what also happens is instead of getting an increase in, this is a 200 degrees C again, I remind you, instead of getting an increase in selectivity to oxygenates, you actually get an increase in selectivity to hydrocarbons, particularly methane. Okay? You don't see an increase in oxygenate selectivity. Not with this mo these, these monolayer catalysts of molybdenum with rhodium on top. Okay? Now, Let's try the other, and, and the other piece of data I have here is for 250 degrees C. The story is a little different there. By going to 250 degrees C, you get about an order of magnitude increase in activity. You get a little suppression, actually, of methane formation, but you don't get any benefit in the C1 oxygenase or the C2 oxygenase, C2 plus oxygenase, by the addition of the molybdenum, okay, in this monolayer form. Okay, so the conclusions here for those, the first catalyst, rhodium molybdenum catalyst preparation method, first of all, that surface, that molybdenum modified alumina surface, is active to oxidatively fragment uh, rhodium carbonate clusters that come in contact with it, that are adsorbed of it. Uh, decarbonylation of the rhodium-1 gym dicarbonyl yields small rhodium clusters. I didn't show you this data basically because this data is not as high quality as I would like, okay? But the XAF data indicates small rhodium clusters plus perhaps some undecomposed or unreduced uh, rhodium-1 uh, in this sample. These adsorb CO reforming the gym dicarbonyl. Hydrogenation activity increases in direct portion of molybdenum content consistent with what's in the literature. But however, the oxygenate selectivity decreases, okay? You don't get a benefit uh, in terms of oxygenate selectivity. Now, the other experiment was to make the rhodium on alumina catalyst, okay, from the, from the carbonyl, and then adsorb molybdenum carbonyl on the surface of the rhodium particles. Now, this is our, actually, the first sample, first uh, graph here I'm going to show you. The particles, the rhodium particles were actually formed by reducing a calcine sample of rhodium nitrate on alumina, okay, and then exposing it to, here's the, IR spectrum before molybdenum carbonyl exposure, 
then exposing it to aluminum carbonyl uh, vapor for 7 minutes, 60 minutes, and 120 minutes. This spike here that goes off scale is the IR band for molybdenum hexcarbonyl in the gas phase. Okay? So now, as you see, with time, this band comes down very rapidly. You form bands here, the three bands, two gem dicarbonyl bands and one linear band, due to CO on rhodium, or CO on, gem, on, on rhodium-1. And you also form sort of a broad uh, band over here at lower wave numbers that's consistent, at least, with what you would expect from aluminum carbonyl just weakly interacting with the Lewis acid sites on the alumina. What's the temperature? The temperature of this is about 50 degrees C. About 50 degrees C. Now, we took this sample, or a similar sample, decomposed, well, first of all, let me back up. The surprising, I guess the surprising thing here is that you immediately, you immediately see CO transferred to the rhodium. Okay, now we can't really tell whether the Aluminum hexcarbonyl decomposes somewhere else, and the CO ends up on the rhodium. That could happen. But there is data in the literature that says that if you take a rhodium single crystal, a rhodium 100 single crystal, room temperature, expose it to molybdenum hexcarbonyl, immediately the molybdenum hexcarbonyl decomposes. Okay? So this is not inconsistent uh, with the fact that the molybdenum hexcarbonyl finds the rhodium particles, the reduced rhodium particles, and decomposes there. Okay? Now, This is another sample. This was actually made from the rhodium-4. And here's a similar IR spectrum of the as synthesized material just exposed to molybdenum hexcarbonyl vapor. And then we've heated it again to remove the CO. And interestingly enough, on this sample, when we re-expose it to CO, we see both gem dicarbonyl, linear, and maybe even some bridging CO uh, on this sample. Now the question is, how will this sample behave uh, in CO hydrogenation. Let me dig up my slide. What we observe is a very positive effect. That is, that this small amount, let me remind you how much we had. We had enough molybdenum hexcarbonyl to give a one-to-one -one rhodium molybdenum atomic ratio. We didn't get it all on there. OJ indicated we got about a tenth of what we thought we would get on the sample. Okay, OJ analysis of the surface. Now, what we find is when we use this catalyst in the reactor, we get an increase, about a two-fold increase in CO hydrogenation activity. We also, though, maintain, we don't get this jump in methane formation or methane selectivity. We maintain the methane selectivity, lose selectivity to C2+, and actually slightly increase okay, our oxygenate selectivity. Now, that's not very, not, not terribly impressive. The nice thing, too, is this also holds at higher temperature. These, although these numbers are small, they do reflect an increase in C1 oxygenates and C2 oxygenates from the addition of molybdenum with an increase in the activity. So the space-time yield for the, higher, for the higher, higher alcohols is going up. Now, to sort of summarize the data, let me see, I've got several other slides, other overheads here. I've graphically shown the effect of the molybdenum addition here. This is the rhodium on alumina. This is the methane. You see when you add the molybdenum as a monolayer, before you add the rhodium, you get an increase in methane selectivity. Here, when we add the molybdenum last, we actually get a small increase, but we basically maintain the methane selectivity, and we boost the selectivity to methanol and C2 plus uh, oxygenase. The data, remember I had just told, I've just told you about the degusa material. The interesting thing is what would happen to the catapult material. Remember at 200 degrees C, the catapult material, uh, catapult material actually produced 61% uh, methanol at 200 degrees C, so that's carbon efficiency. <coughs> Will that go away if I add now, if I add molybdenum in this form? Well, what happens is if you add molybdenum as a monolayer, you actually see a loss, a significant loss in methanol selectivity, some increase here in the C2 plus selectivity. If you add it as molybdenum hexcarbonyl, you get a five-fold increase in activity, basically no change in methane, a decrease in C2 again, 
And now we're talking about 74% oxygenase uh, from a rhodium alumina catalyst at 200 degrees. Okay, so there's a significant positive effect of that second method for incorporating the molybdenum. Now, the conclusions there are, first of all, from this molybdenum hexcarbonyl deposition on rhodium alumina, the majority of the precursor decomposes to give, we think, molybdenum hexcarbonyl fragments on the rhodium. We see gem dicarbonyl rhodium and linearly absorbed CO uh, species. The uh, decarbonylate surface species absorb CO, giving gem dicarbonyl rhodium as well as some linearly bound CO. We get a two to five fold increase in activity. The total oxygenate selectivity improves modestly, and the C2 oxygenate selectivity improves at the expense, what we think of as at the expense of C2 plus hydrocarbons. Now, the story, I guess the take home message from this story is that the interface, as Professor Sockler was talking about earlier, between rhodium and an early transition metal oxide, or rhodium and molybdenum in a lower oxidation state, how you form that interface directly affects the promotional effects that you see. And what we're trying to do here is use organometallics to engineer that interface. And this is just our first attempt. I hope we can, we can do better in the future. Thank you. Uh, as you may know, we are very active in IFP in selective hydrogenation, and we have developed some catalysts, five metallic mm -hmm. catalysts for metal, right. which is resemble your metal. Mm -hmm. What I can tell you is that we have not published uh, already data on molybdenum uh, carbonyl decomposition on any kind of metals, but recently we have performed experiments on molybdenum carbonyl decomposition on metallic cobalt. We pretty found the same results as you found, which means that we decompose selectively molybdenum carbonate in certain optimized conditions, of course, on metallic cobalt. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So, yeah. I've, I've actually me measured the XFs for uh, Jean Marie say the, uh, the tin rhodium uh, systems, yeah. and so we c it has a common origin, I'd okay. say, basically. I would agree <laughs> that the uh, molybdenum uh, carbonyl was selectively decomposed on the rhodium. We had very similar experience with uh, uh, rhenium carbonyl on platinum in, in a zeolite, and all the decomposition was on the metal particle. So uh, that is uh, f uh, f uh, common chemistry. I have one question. When you say either the rhodium on top of the molybdenum or the molybdenum on top of the rhodium, that sounds as if geometry was important. But uh, in the molybdenum carbonyl case, Formally, at least, you have zero valent molybdenum when right. you decompose it. And uh, in the uh, aluminum uh, or sub alumina supported molybdenum uh, oxide, uh, I don't know oxide. what valency you have. Uh, do you do anything to get the same valency, or do we uh, have two different uh, states I in agree. the two catalysts? Uh, and and uh, which, which valency would you estimate is uh, uh, important of the molybdenum? Okay. In the molybdenum carbonyl case, there's no doubt that, the, at least in my mind, that the valence state would be lower, formal oxidation state would be lower. Uh, we've tried different treatments, and we've also got XF data for trying treating in hydrogen, treating in oxygen, trying to change the oxidation state. But we're not there. I can't answer your question in, in, in any unequivocal fashion. I just know that these are two different preparation procedures, and I would expect that you'd have molybdenum 6 and you'd have molybdenum, you know, in an intermediate oxidation state. Or oh, you think it's six, not four, in the case of the... Uh, uh, well, I must. I, I, I don't want to speculate. I don't want to speculate. I wonder myself, have you uh, tried any other supports for this work? Uh, We've tried silica. The reason we stuck with alumina, basically, is because of the nice spreading of the molybdenum oxides and, and other early transition metal oxides on, uh, on alumina. Uh, silica, we, we tend to have a harder time dispersing the oxide, and it was really a question of whether you could, could get the uh, precursor to go on the oxide as opposed to just on the other bare areas of the support. But I know there are methods of doing that, but I, we, we just stuck with the alumina in this case. I wonder if it might be easy on titania or zirconia or something like that. Yes. Another thing that worries me, and it's something that's worried me a little bit during the afternoon with a number of the other presentations, selectivity in a lot of reactions changes with conversion. 
Yes. Uh, have you made any? This is this is all was all this data was at less than five percent conversion. No, no, we haven't made an, uh, an attempt to make it a a, re a realistic industrial, uh, you know, test. Have you looked at the effect of the molybdenum content? Trying to plot the selectivity versus the ratio molybdenum volume. We have for the for the oxides, yes. uh, and but we only have the few points that you see. We haven't tried it for the hex carbonyl addition. We haven't done it for the next curve addition. We, we tried another point. We tried another point. We saw absolutely no change. In other words, if we doubled, we doubled the amount of, of hex curve we added. We saw no change. But that just means the curve goes up and like that. And I'm not sure where, you know. I think the plateau region, though, is at a very low concentration mm -hmm. uh, of molybdenum. I guess that's that's what I would. You may be right, but I suggest that you have these data. Uh, sure. uh, gen Genta is a carbonized rodeo. Yes. It, uh, the directory is interacted with the polypidenum site, or otherwise it's a uh, I would speculate that they're interacting with the molybdenum. Uh, I, I don't have a basis for that other than small shifts in the IR bands, and also just hopefully, now this is again, this is not completed work in my mind, because we need to analyze the XAFS data that I showed you for uh, the dicarbonyl on the molybdenum covered alumina. Uh, that, if we can get second near neighbor information, we'd be able to tell for certain whether it was on the, the molybdenum oxide or on the alumina. But that, that hasn't been done yet. Basically, Prasad, my postdoc, finished up last October. <laughs> this is the state, uh, and I'm going to have to sort of put on my hat and finish the, finish the rest of the uh, work. When you add the molybdenum uh, carbonyl on the aluminum surface, do you check the hydroxyl group with this? I mean, molybdenum carbonyl interact with hydroxyl group or aluminum? I looked at that the other day, Steve. I, I didn't see a, I didn't see a, something. There's nothing obvious there. There was nothing obvious there. But the the, the literature. This is dehydroxylated 500 degrees C. So there's not a lot of hydroxyls. Maybe a third of a monolayer or something like that, or a third to half a monolayer. Uh, the literature. Some early work for, by Basse. Uh, says that the molybdenum carbonyl goes down with the oxygen interacting with an aluminum ion. And that's, uh, you see remnants of that in the IR spectrum. Uh, I don't see any real evidence for inter interaction with hydroxyl groups. Well, if there are no more further questions, I'd like to thank our speaker.